Welcome to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts. I'm your host, Paula Cooney, the brand manager of the Zamboni Company, and I'm joined by Marty Elliott from our Brantford sales team today. I'm thrilled to introduce our guests, Gina Huntsinger, the museum director of the Charles M. Schultz Museum and Research Center, and Jean Schultz, the museum founder. Welcome, ladies. Hi, thank you, hi. So, so excited you guys are here today. I thought maybe what I could do is just give the listeners a little bit of information about the background of kind of how our two companies uh, became connected or our two entities, I guess. I've been with the company for, I think, 23 years now, and I was kind of peripherally aware of the Zamboni and Peanuts connection, but I work closely with Richard Zamboni, uh, who's the son of Frank, the founder of the company. And he tells me the story that in uh, January of 1980, the first Peanuts strip actually had a reference to Zamboni. And a friend of his mailed that comic to him asking if he'd seen it before because Charles Schultz, AKA Sparky, had mentioned Zamboni. And I think he still has that letter somewhere in our archive, which is kind of fun. And so uh, Richard wrote a letter back and he wrote it to Snoopy actually, and got a paw stamped reply from Snoopy shortly thereafter, which was really fun. We have that in our archive. And as I'm saying this out loud, I'm thinking, I know we have a page on Zamboni.com that has some Snoopy references. I think we should put up some of those letters and share them with people. It'd be really fun. I definitely think you should share the letters and the ones with the Snoopy prop print. Absolutely. That, that is, it was so delightful. And then I think that uh, Sparky had a hand in it or maybe his assistant at the time and uh, mentioned something because I think Richard Zamboni sent a hat and he said something in the letter about how Snoopy really liked wearing the hat because it kept his ears warm on the ice. I mean, just those cute, sweet little references in there, just like what really were so special for Richard at the time. And he and Sparky then had some conversation back and forth and there were some comics and exchanges of things that were really kind of fun for us in our history. But I think what I really like to ask, kind of going off of that is um, a little bit of background on Sparky, kind of coming from Minnesota and hockey fan and player. And like, how did he end up in Santa Rosa? I wasn't part of Sparky's life back then. He came to Santa Rosa or Sonoma County in 1958. But I understand that Joyce, his wife, wasn't so keen, wanted to get out of the cold winters. They looked around. There was before the internet, some people may remember, but I doubt that many of you remember, a real estate company called Prestige Properties. And they made up a catalog of properties all over the United States that were prestige worthy. And they looked at a property in Monterey County, Carmel. And Sparky said always, even though he loved to go down and play in the AT&T, the Crosby first, and then the AT&T, he said that that was depressing to him down there. And I, I don't know why, I mean, you know, what, I, you can't explain feelings like that. But then they saw a piece of property up here in Sebastopol that had a photographer's studio on it. And that attracted Sparky. So they loved the studio. It had property. Joyce was interested in riding horses. So that's how they got to Sonoma County. The reason the ice arena is in Santa Rosa, of course, is because it's the largest city in the area and that's where you would put a commercial enterprise like an ice arena. Santa Rosa in 1968, 69, when they were looking at the property, the whole area where we are was, there was a shopping center directly off the freeway and then a lot of undeveloped area. So they bought a large piece, which now holds the ice arena, a gift shop, the lot, that had three houses on it that is now the museum, the baseball field next to it, and then Sparky's studio, which is at the end of a good long walk from the corner. So that appealed to them and they built the ice arena first. And then Sparky's studio was built uh, two years later, maybe three years. The, the ice arena was finished and opened in 1969. The studio was opened at the end of 72, so say 73. So, um, so it was a few years before they finished the office part of it. 
It's such a wonderful property. I just remember being mesmerized when I walked around there. I didn't know where to go first. You know, the first time I think that I visited was uh, when the museum had its grand opening. We were really excited and I believe that uh, some of the Zamboni family members were able to attend that as well. I remember seeing there was an uh, artist from Japan who did one of the beautiful pieces inside the museum and I always forget his name. I Yoshi. Don't know. Yoshi. Yeah. And um, he had this dramatic long cream colored coat, I think it was, that maybe had Snoopy on the back or the front of it. And it was yeah. just gorgeous. And that was just, you know, part of this uh, showmanship of the building. It was so subtle yet dramatic. And it was a uh, wonderful, wonderful time. Yoshi was dramatic and his artwork in the museum is dramatic. It, it's, there are two large pieces that sort of mark the, the Great Hall. You really could spend so much time just looking through those pieces because they're so comprehensive and there's so much detail and, and the little subtle things that you don't necessarily pick up there that some of the volunteers and staff at the museum can show people or what really bring it to life. You could look at something and say that's just a flat wall with some you know art on it, but when you are able to hear the stories and learn a bit more about what the thought that really went into it, it makes it so much more special. And sometimes we tell to special people that the skylights are thought bubbles in the architect's mind. I love that. I so love now you that. know a secret that we don't tell very many people. Well, I don't know. Nobody probably will hear this podcast, so maybe no one will learn the secret. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked a little bit about how the property was discovered, how it was kind of built out. I think that um, a unique thing is that you know you have a lot of context, you're there, I'm sure, an awful lot in the facility and you were there a lot with Sparky. Maybe you can talk a little bit about a day in the life of Sparky at the property because I just think that that's such a fun story of you know how he'd get up and where he'd go and what he'd do. He seemed to be a little bit of a creature of habit. He was a creature of habit and um, it served him well. Sparky got up in the morning and um, he remembers the time when we were first married when he used to bring me coffee in bed. Now, that was very nice of him, and I don't stay in bed very long, so it was nice of him to bring me coffee, but as soon as he drove out the, of the driveway, I was out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, because that had been his habit. It had been his habit since the ice arena opened in 79. First, he drove from Sebastopol, drove the kids to school in Santa Rosa, and then came to the ice arena. And then when the ice arena was being built, I believe they bought a piece of property on the other side of Santa Rosa. So he would drive the girls, his two girls, Amy and Jill, who were skating patch and freestyle in the mornings. He would drive them into the arena because patch and freestyle start at 5.30 or six. And then he'd have breakfast and then he'd proceed on to, first of all, upstairs. He had his office when they sold their property. This is way more history than anybody can even put together. But after they, they built the ice arena, sold the property in Sebastopol, and moved north of Santa Rosa. All this time, Sparky was traipsing kids to school and back to the property in Sebastopol, or once the arena was open, to the arena for breakfast and they remodeled the upstairs into Sparky's studio. And we have a room up there that I realized, oh, 10 years ago, the people who work here now, because they're young people, they come in, they work for a few years, it's their first job, and then they go on and do something else, very profitable, we hope. So I said, they don't know who Sparky is. So there are a lot of skating instructors and employees who've been there for a long time and they may talk about Sparky, but all these hordes of young people who come through don't know. So I, once the museum was built, I realized, oh, people need to know something they, and they need to have some reference. So the break room upstairs, I've made signs put up pictures of Sparky when his office was in the ice arena. In one, he's putting on his skates, and another, he's sitting at his drawing board. And we have the tagline up there, Sparky was here. So they can see if 
they're interested and curious, and they might even ask a question. So, so that really was the first museum right there. You made a well, mini museum. We made his, uh, his the break room into a museum. So it was because he was working in the museum for a short period of time and down in the coffee shop all the time, and I happened to be taking my daughter in to skate those early morning hours, and I ran into him, and that's how we met. That's so fun because, uh, you know, Paramount Iceland, which is near the Zamboni facility in Paramount, California, it's just down the street from us. We hear from people that so many people met there, you know, skating together or whatever, and got married. We have like yeah. lots of couples. So there's this ice rink wedding thing. So people, you should start skating. If you're looking for your significant other, hockey and skating. Yeah, it's that's true. right. There's so many good relationships that come out of even just super long friendships, you know, Ice skating rinks are community centers, and Sparky knew that, and it was so it's so wonderful just how the family, the Schultz family, has kept a community center uh, thriving for over 50 years. Sparky's famous quote about the ice arena was that he wanted it to be a place where people could just hang out because he thought people don't hang out enough. It was the original Starbucks. <laughs> That's right. And the interesting so, thing is that, you know, Sparky was working all the time, but he still liked to just go to the ice arena, sit there, watch people, maybe talk to someone, but what he would say, just hang out. I heard that, uh, and I've actually seen that there's a special table in the Warm Puppy Cafe that's reserved for Sparky, and that that was kind of part of his daily ritual that we were talking about is going in there and maybe having a cup of coffee and his usual lunch. And again, that whole creature of habit thing. It's just so fun that that table well, is had, Sure, his. he had breakfast there. Okay. And went over to the studio and then came back and had lunch there. And then often came back for tea on his way home. So people who cared and uh, word got around that he was there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And there's a wonderful story that I love. Stefan Pastis said that he stalked Sparky. Stefan Pastis, who draws pearls before swine, mm. said that he stalked Park Sparky and came up and sat there, got there early one morning and sat there until um, Sparky came in. And I think he waited and let him eat his breakfast maybe. And then he walked over <laughs> and, um, and of course, as soon as Sparky heard he was a cartoonist, he was interested because he really loved to support cartoonists. And um, he said, well, do you have anything with you? And Stefan said, yes, I have it in the car. So he said, well, go get it. <laughs> so, That's so fun. He was a thoughtful stalker. He waited to interrupt him until he was done. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Always and, a good way to get the person to uh, be receptive to your advances. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. So, anyway. But Stefan, Stefan was a thoughtful stalker, as you say. <laughs> well, that's fun. I love, I love the stories about the rink, and I love the history. And I've, I've not, I don't think I've ever been there for. I try and get up there a couple times a year. I love Santa Rosa. I was born in Northern California, and Santa Rosa became uh, part of my life probably because of the Charles M. Schultz Museum. And I, I love being there. And a friend of mine is. Uh, involved with a group that makes wine up there. And so we actually go up a few times a year. It helps us um, make sure that we put it on the calendar and we get a chance to go up there. It's uh, called Kings Hill Cellars. And we really enjoy uh, visiting there with people and feeling that sense of community. And it just, it really does spread out through the whole community. So I can just imagine, you know, the arena that that's that, that hub where people go to um, enjoy being together. And you have a lot of fun events over the course of the year. I think there's some Christmas shows and hockey tournaments I've not ever been in town for. I think I was there once for a hockey tournament, but it was like the next day. So I missed it. So maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about kind of some of the fun stuff that happens at the rink. So the rink has, we have junior hockey, right? And the, and then we also have Sparky's favorite event there, which was the senior hockey tournament that he, that he organized and and continue to support, um, and it's still going on today. So we have people from all over the U.S., and we've actually had people from other countries too, Canada, of course, and we've had um, 
we've had people from Hawaii, we've had people from Japan, there's been many different countries represented over the years, but it's a wonderful thing that happens in, in, in July, and uh, it's for a week, and we shut down the arena, and it's just senior hockey all day long, um, and it's absolutely a ton of fun, um, and people should come watch it if they want to see this. It's, it's such a sight to behold, and people have a great time. There's Is a, that usually in July? I, I'm trying to remember. It's in mid-July. Mid uh, now it's in mid-July. It's probably been different times over the years, but now it is. Um, and the other thing, of course, we have lots of other youth hockey tournaments, too, that happen. But um, And then, of course, in, in the Christmas season, the ice arena is decked out with all of the Christmas decor. And people come from all over Northern California to skate there and have a cup of hot chocolate because it's a tradition for people to come and, and hang out during the Christmas season at the arena. Um, and we have a tree lighting ceremony that the uh, figure skaters put on for people just to celebrate the holiday season. I will say that that hot chocolate is something to behold. I don't know what it is. That hot chocolate is magnificent. And I'm not a huge hot chocolate fan, but I do have to have that when I visit Warm Puppy Cafe for sure. It's, it definitely, it's, it adds to the whole, the whole experience, I think. I think that what I feel when I walk in that building is in the rink itself is like this, I guess, is it a Tyrolean theme? There's this whole, like, you feel like almost you're in Europe. It's so spectacular. And I don't really know what drove that design. Jean, was that something that was a, a sparky thing? That, well, that was Joyce's idea. Joyce, okay. Joyce went to Europe or Switzerland, I suppose, or maybe Austria and had a photographer take pictures and they reproduced those pictures um, on the wall in little chalets and so forth. It's just glorious. And the other, you know, the icing on the cake being the Zamboni brand manager, I have to give a shout out to the Zamboni machine in that building because you actually had artists come in and hand paint the Peanuts characters in the skating scene on there. And I remember the first time that I saw that, I almost had tears in my eyes because I couldn't believe the amount of work that went into it. And you guys have been so kind to share some photos with us that we actually were able to share on our website of the painting process and the artists, the detail that they went to to put the graphics on the machine. It really is a, a moving work of art itself. And you know, people love watching the Zamboni go around and around. You know that. but. It's always amazing that they can just watch it. And it does the same thing for 10 minutes, but people love to watch it. Charlie Brown actually said there are three things in life that people love to watch or that they love. It's a crackling fire and a, a flowing stream or something like that. And the Zamboni machine going around and around. And that's one <laughs> of our favorite comics. And so, so memorable, it like sticks in my mind. And if we do um, interviews with reporters, that's one of the things that we will see end up as like a quote in their story. They'll always reference that comic. And, uh, you know, it, the, the history of that is so in, amazing. I go back to that thing of Richard getting a letter from a friend saying, did you see this? And then uh, the history kind of going on from there. But um, we've documented and you guys are kind enough to share artwork from, I believe, 50 comics that referenced either Zamboni or had the Zamboni machine in there. And so many fun ones like, uh, I remember Woodstock, driving up like a snowbank to get into the bird bath so that he could resurface and he's on a little Zamboni machine and then you know Snoopy is like I wonder I always wondered how he got the Zamboni up there and you know just funny little things like that it's just who would even think of that and the creativity of weaving that story in I, I think that uh, Richard had met and I don't know if you were you and Sparky were together Richard and Alice Zamboni came up to Santa Rosa years and years and years ago, it has to be at least 20 or 30 years ago. And they said that was the first time they had met Sparky. And I don't know if it was the only time, but I think they met him in the Warm Puppy Cafe. And um, Sparky said something about that he got a kick out of every time somebody would say, what the heck is a Zamboni? Because <laughs> sometimes he would just reference it in, you know, in text in the comic. And until he introduced it with a little visual, People were just, they, they paid so much attention to him and they didn't, it was bigger than our brand. They didn't even know what it was. So thanks for making us famous, I guess, Sparky. <laughs> well, that's right. And Sparky always said that his comic strip ideas came to him when he thought, well, how would it be or what would happen if 
So you can imagine him thinking, they're playing hockey on the ice, they have to clean the ice. What would happen if the Zamboni were on the birdbath and Woodstock was driving it? And so I think he did that. And But then he thought, well, how did he get up there? You know. So all these things go through a cartoonist's mind and he has to solve those problems. It, 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 was, it is pretty amazing. And you, you mentioned cartoonists. So I'm going to kind of jump from the rink to the museum, but I do jump all over the place. So hopefully keep up with me on this. But I think, uh, and maybe Gina, you have some reference to this too. You guys have cartoonist series where they come in and are in on the weekends, maybe with kids and other folks. So maybe you can tell, talk a little bit about some of the museum activities as well. Well, Jeannie started this when she, when she created the museum. Um, she wanted it to, one of the mission statements of the museum is to, um, is to further cartoon and cartoon art. So one of the things that we do is we bring in um, a cartoonist every second Saturday and they share their work. And sometimes they're famous and sometimes they're just up and coming, but it's always those, those artists in, in that art form. And we've had so many incredible cartoonists here over the years, and Jeannie could speak to that, but it's because of her um, wanting to push the legacy forward and wanting to celebrate cartoon, cartooning and cartoonists and Sparky's love of cartooning and cartoonists. Well, and where can I say, where else can a kid come with, with or without his parents, his or her parents, and sit and talk to a cartoonist for two hours if they want to, and just listen to that part. Well, it doesn't matter whether the cartoonist is famous in the kids' world, but that but drawing is magic. And when those cartoonists come and talk about how they maybe they're they've had books published, so they can talk about how they had their books published. And the kid who loves to draw can see that there's some reason. To for his love and reason to keep doing it. And I just think that um, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we offer for, it's only two hours once a month, but boy, we've had people who come every single second Saturday. I remember being there for a special event that you had and I his name is gonna escape me and I don't wanna put anyone on the spot, but it was a gentleman who was a cartoonist who does like the puzzle books and he does like themed puzzle books. Maybe one's about dinosaurs or, you know, they're oh, all about different things. Joe was. Joe was. He was incredible. And the hilarious thing is, you know, me stick figure with crayon drawing person and he's hosting, you know, how to draw Snoopy or how to draw some character or, you know, how to draw an owl or whatever. And he's doing it right there in front of people. And it's just like, beep, pop, boop, you know, and there's this perfect, gorgeous, Thing, and we're all drawing these little ridiculous things and looking at them and going, wait a minute. But it's just that opportunity to relate that, you know, this person has the special talent they're sharing with you. And if you're, you know, 120 years old, 20 years old, or five years old, you're going to have this really en engaging experience. And so you guys opening up, um, you know, making accessible that talent and those people and giving them a platform to engage, whether there's, you know, a few dozen people or a few hundred people, it's always such a fun time. There's such this great energy in the room. Um, and the last time I, I was there, I also remember being up in the room where sometimes the cartoonists meet, I think it's where you do your Saturday's event. And there was like a little uh, black and white panel to make your own comic strip, like just kind of freestyle, create your own comic strip. I must have been with some talented people because I came out of there feeling really bad about my artwork. <laughs> my creativity light bulb was off that day apparently. It was it was so much fun though. What a great like way to have fun. I just could imagine almost even having a party in there and that's what everybody does. Like, you know, they have these painting parties where you have a glass of wine and try and paint the flower thing that's on the wall. And it's that same feeling where you're connecting with people in a way that you wouldn't normally. So really, really fun. We have done that where you have a glass of wine and then uh, taste wine tasting and drawing. But, but one funny thing that we've done for adults is to have to pass your paper around so you draw the eyes or the head or the whatever and then you pass it on to the next person who is told to draw some part and so that's kind of fun too and if you can't draw which I can't do that covers up your mistakes it doesn't matter because somebody else gets your mistake or your whatever I yeah. think I, you just gave me my idea for my next uh, dinner party. 
I think we're going to be passing the car the cartoon strip around the um, to see how what we end up with a character at the end. That would be super fun. What a great idea. I can give you several different kinds of suggestions to do that. That would be a fun party. Yeah. I'm involving wine though. So sign me up for that class when you guys have that next. I'll be there. And Paula, you know, the one thing we have done recently is we just added how to draw Snoopy, how to draw um, Woodstock, how to draw the Snoopy siblings on our website now. So people who can't come to the museum in person, they can actually get um, a, a professional cartoonist teaching them how to draw those things. And it's for every age. So, and it's on demand, so you can do it at any time. That is amazing. Which um, which URL is that? Is that the Schultz Museum? It's called Museum on Demand. So it's just schultzmuseum.org. Well, that's great. If somebody's too far away to get to you, they can uh, do that. And there, and that really is a, a fun way to um, learn a little bit more about the characters and the museum as well. We did a, a walkthrough of a new exhibition and put it on the web. People could walk through it with us. So it was a live walkthrough um, for an opening. And we had people from Australia and Europe and Canada, Japan, Japan all there. And 160 people or something were on that, on that um, program. And they wouldn't have ever gotten there for right. the opening. So we recognize that and other museums say the same thing. And that means we have to keep doing that. And it's a lot of work. <laughs> That's what you did. You started something. Now you got to keep it up. That's right. I love the, um, the one of the things about the museum that I, I find just captivating when I go in is how how there are so many things that are so far back in time that are kind of encapsulated for people to see there, but how it's so modern and how the exhibitions are constantly changing and the thoughtfulness put into the theming of the exhibition. Maybe you guys want to talk a little bit about kind of how those decisions are made and maybe how people might send in things to share or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, there's a there's usually a, a large group of, of people who get together and we brainstorm exhibition ideas and Jean Jean Schultz is in there too she's we're all bringing ideas to the table you know Sparky spent 50 years drawing the strip and he was a genius and he was um, a master cartoonist so and he thought about human um, human nature and humanity in such a deep way that there's endless possibilities of um, expressing what he what he put across in his art so we have so much to work with. It's it's super fun to think of what to do next because it's doesn't it's never going to end. The list must be like ten thousand ideas long. <laughs> a lot. A lot. He, just, he understood human nature so well, and he twisted it at the end in such a wonderful way that makes you laugh, even if you're dealing with difficult subjects. Well, and we have a really creative staff. I have to say that when when this whole process goes on and people are throwing things out and the director's writing on the wall well they they just throw out the ideas i think that'll never make a that'll never make an exhibition what are they talking about you know that's crazy and lo and behold the staff is so clever that they know how to pull all the pieces together and make it interesting informative educational fun and they also draw in other references, other pop culture references. I remember being there for, I think it was Peace, Love and Woodstock. That was maybe the last uh, exhibition yeah. that I saw. And it was so fun because there were things like from the 60s and 70s that n weren't necessarily Peanuts related or, you know, they, they were telling the story that helped influence that exhibition and yeah. that you take those things into consideration and the the, beautiful graphics and the really incredible and creative ways that things are not just hanging on the wall, but that they're interactive displays and exhibits and, you know, videos and things for people to really learn. So every time I go there, it's so fun because the facility has these different unique experiences. And it always, like I said, it just feels so modern, yet it has so much vintage memorabilia that it's this great contrast in the space and then the things that are inside of that space. Well, when the Peace, Love, and Woodstock was up, I was um, raising babies when that was going on, when Woodstock itself was going on. 
So I learned all about the music festival, which I really didn't know. I didn't know that 600,000 people came and that it wasn't at in Woodstock anymore. It was at so-and-so's farm because it was too muddy and there were too many people. So I keep learning something. I learned a lot about women's suffrage in the, in the Lucy exhibition. So, you know, you may have, I may have a college degree, but I don't know all those things. Well, and it's so fun because it, it really, the museum is like catering to people of all ages. So kids are gonna have a great visual experience and maybe take away some learning of, hey, I didn't know that that era existed. And the adults are really gonna have fun, like taking a deep dive above and beyond just the comic strips of the character artwork that may be on display. So. So, so many things in the museum. Um, you have a, a an adjacent new property there or something built on the property that I saw the last time I was there. Maybe you guys wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, we have a wonderful new place called Othmar Hall, which um, is our education arm of the museum so that we can educate kids and adults um, and, and have some some space there for that, for that to happen. Um, it's a gorgeous facility, and of course, it was named so aptly by our last director, Karen Johnson, who Oth, so Othmar is the name of Linus's favorite teacher, and so it was just perfect, a perfect uh, way to name that that space. And we are still in the middle of using it, but I can definitely see in the future. I'd love to see retreats on creativity or things that people could do to really help people further their own creativity in that space. It's so beautiful, I just wanna live there. Can I move yeah. in? And and um, Othmar is the teacher, but Othmar was the first name of a friend of Sparky's from his very first days in Sebastopol. His name was Jerry Jerish, but Othmar was his first name. So that's how Miss Othmar got her name. So it all goes back to Sparky and um, the comic strip and then Sparky and then something to do with him. The other thing is that when we used to have classes before Othmar Hall, we had to close down the education room for the classes. And people like to go into the education room and just draw. I mean, that when we, planned the museum, I went around and stuck my nose in a whole lot of museums. And this was 1997, 1998, 1999. And I saw computers being used. They'd have three computers and one child would be banging keys on the computer and moving things around and three children with their parents would be behind him or her. and they weren't doing anything and they weren't doing using the programs in any way that anyone standing behind them could learn. It was just, it was just chaotic to me. And so I said, we're not having computers in the museum and except for the staff, of course, they can have computers. But, and I said to Sparky, it doesn't make sense. Your whole art is based on your brain and your hand and the connection between them and your heart, not on a computer. And he said, yes, you're right, Jeannie, you're right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went back to the planning committee and said, we're not having computers as part of our, as part of our um, museum because Sparky and I agreed we don't want them. So believe it or not, when I'm gone, they'll probably put in computers, but I think we're all sick of our computers, Jeannie. We would, the pen and paper is such a nice, you know, it's a wonderful method and a wonderful connection, like you said. So it's your, not, it's your hand, your brain, yeah. and your heart. And I yeah. think that, um, I think that's what happens in the education room. People, their pencils, their colored things, their crayons, I think they're the sheets that you can fill out, as you said. And I think that's valuable, but we always had to close that down when we had a class or a speaker, but now we can do all that in Othmar Hall, so we can keep that room open for the visitor who just wants to come in and spend 20 minutes in there doing something. 
I think I never even noticed that there is no computer interactivity at the museum. And it's refreshing because, you know, I'm dating myself now, but I remember before people had cell phones and they were walking around and the only thing they were looking at was this square black object in their hand. And it's nice to have a place where screens aren't interrupting what you're doing or where you aren't, the only way you can consume information is by pushing a digital button and then going to the next screen and going to the next screen where you can learn in a different way. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's actually refreshing now because we all, we're all doing it in our own time. So, so Jeannie's we had, had vision and it was a good one. You know, yeah. it's, it's, we really need to get back to some of that. We, we long for it, I, I long for it. So I have to tell you a little funny thing. When we first opened the museum, we talked about banning cell phones. Now, now I mean, this was 2002 and we were talking about it in 2001 before we were opening. But now you, you couldn't possibly, most you can do is say, please be sensitive about your use of your phone or something like that. Right. And I don't think we even bother with that. But no. I, it just amuses me to think that we actually, it was, there was an environment 20 years ago that you could talk about not having people have their phones on. Oh my which is, goodness! If I lose my, if I leave my phone at the office, I have to come back and get it. We do have a lot. We have selfie places where people can take the pictures with the characters. And actually, um, at the ice arena, there's uh, Peanuts Abbey Road, so you can be walking across the street with the characters in the crosswalk, just like the the Beatles did. And we have the labyrinth that's on the property, which is another super fun thing to do that's outside. Of course, you have every statue. So you can go to Snoopy's dog house and take a picture or Snoopy with a who's skate, who's a hockey player or Charlie Brown. So there's lots of different things here to take pictures. And I love in front of the um, Snoopy's gift shop, the um, like the handprints, almost like the Grauman's Chinese theater in the ground and like the star stuff. And there's some fun little memorabilia there. So to add to what you're talking about, I think some of my favorite places there, because I'm a girl and I love shopping, are the <laughs> gift shops. Um, I love the Snoopy gift shop because they have like crazy one-of-a-kind things you're never going to see anywhere else, imported things, things that people wouldn't have had access to. So being there and like just kind of sifting through the racks is so yeah. much fun. And I always find unique things to bring back. I remember bringing something back for a friend, a full-grown friend, not a little toddler friend, which was uh, the, the yellow t-shirt with the zigzag, the Charlie Brown shirt. And I brought it back and gave it to them. And they were like, this is one of my favorite things I've ever seen. <laughs> and then the museum gift shop, which is, you know, more contemporary, kind of like a museum gift shop you'd think would be, but just so many fun things that are like tied into whatever particular exhibit is in there. And people can find, I think, both of those online and order from them and have stuff shipped to them. You guys ship around the world, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, she does, Nan. They do. They uh, We send it everywhere. Um, and actually right now, snoopygift.com. Um, she has books up on online and Jeannie is signing some of those books, um, which is a wonderful added uh, benefit um, for the, uh, right now. So we I think you'll be seeing an order with my last name on it in the uh, next 45 minutes. I think you ordered something not too long, too long ago. I did. I bought some things. My, um, my last Christmas basket included an awful lot of peanuts stuff. So oh. I, I think I told you I had a glass of wine one night and got a little crazy on the ordering, but it was really fun. And when the package came, it was like Santa came because I was opening it up going, wow, I really didn't realize how many things I got. <laughs> but the one thing I have to uh, mention from there, and I don't know if they still have any in the shop or if people can find it online, but the peanuts origami. I gave that as gifts to people and it's this beautiful book with origami papers that when you fold them up the right way, which I can assure you I would not be able to do, it would look like Snoopy or it would even be, there's one that's like a bobblehead when you put the two pieces together. It was absolutely magic when I gave that to people who had some younger kids and you know that was a, a great way to have them engage with characters they may, may not necessarily have been aware of already, but so many fun things it was uh, really, really fun. Gina, haven't we had a class? We just actually an we, online class. We're having of, virtual classes with virtual origami, yeah. and uh, people have really loved it. We actually brought it back a second time with that particular book that you're talking about, Paula. 
Um, and the other thing we do do in the museum when people come to visit is we do have an origami piece that you can do that is simple and fun to do and kids can be successful at it too that is in our education room so if you do come um look for that because it's super fun to take that home you know what i think is so fun is um when i'm there maybe you guys can talk a little about the volunteers or how people can become a volunteer when i'm there i just feel like this real appreciation from the volunteers for you being a visitor in the facility and them wanting to help you make the most out of what you want your visit to be so if you want to go upstairs and you know cartoon doodle they're going to point you in that direction if you want every bit of information that you can get about woodstock they're going to point you in the direction of all of those things whatever it is that you're there for they just are so gracious with their time and amazing i i like to think that part of that is because we all try to represent what sparky was you know it was have fun be nice <laughs> and be creative probably but I, I think um, we have different ways people can get involved. Um, if you go on to the SchultzMuseum.org again, there's places for adults to volunteer, kids to volunteer, people can become members. We have actually stuff on our website where you can do museum activities at home. So there's lots of uh, free activities on there too to connect with. So that's all the different ways that you can sort of get involved. But as far as volunteering goes that's probably the closest uh people can be involved and it's like a family well they are they are like a club and like you said a family and they they definitely have such great enthusiasm i think i remember the last time i was there i met somebody who he and his parents had just flown in from uh michigan i believe and they came there specifically to go to the museum that, that people can really make this like a destination. You know, how long could somebody spend on that property? Like, does do they need a day? Do they need maybe a couple days? Or if somebody's gonna come in from out of town, is there like, are there hotels in the area they could stay at and then they could kind of split it up into a couple of days worth of activity? Let me just use this as an example. The senior hockey tournament is one of the most favorite hockey tournaments because the, the people who play hockey bring their spouses or their friends because Sonoma County and we're near Napa County. This is a playground for uh, adults. There's so much to do. It's gorgeous. The ocean is only 45 minutes away. It's a beautiful coastline. And we have amazing wines and actually craft breweries now. And there's so many hiking, natural things to do outside. You can kayak, you can, you can fish. There's just so much to do here. So Sonoma County, and this Northern California area, there's just so much to do. So people can spend a whole week here and have plenty to keep them busy. But on the campus, I would suggest, you know, it depends on how fast you like to go through things, but it is a whole day. You know, you can skate, you can shop, you can eat at the Warm Puppy and you have to have a hot chocolate. We have um, theater schedules with all these different interesting um, topics on Sparky and his life and also the animated uh, specials that you know take you back to a time when you used to see those so there's just so much to do on this campus and in this area and and they can also like you know plan it around an event so if somebody uh, does go to schultzmuseum.org and you know signs up to become a member there are some fun membership events that you know I keep seeing these things we are our, our company is a member and Richard Zamboni has made sure to keep that membership alive through the years so it's something Thank really near and dear to us but one of the favorite things every year is uh, the member perks that come our way and the annual Christmas ornament is always a, a treat when we see that coming through. So Richard's got those all squirreled away in a very special box until it's Christmas time and then they all light up his tree. So um, oh. thank you guys for continuing on with that tradition. It's one that we really love. Well, I, I wanna be respectful of you guys' time and um, if I think we covered everything we were planning to chit chat about today, unless you guys had any other thoughts or if Marty or Ben had any questions we wanted to weave in here. I certainly got to go through my list, which I really appreciate. Oh, thanks, Paula. Thank you, uh, ladies. It's an honor uh, to be part of this uh, podcast today. I really appreciate uh, Paula reaching out and asking me to pers participate. And uh, Jean, I wanted to uh, ask a question that I actually, when Paula asked me a couple weeks ago to participate, I shared this with a, a close friend of mine and uh, we grew up together from uh, a young, young age. And he wanted me to ask this question because we both followed the, the comic strip and the cartoons. And his question to me was, if you get a chance, could you ask Gene Schultz 
why was it that Charlie never was able to kick the football? Why Lucy always pulled it away? And I thought, I'd, okay, well, let me ask Jean, and maybe she might have an answer. I don't know. Sparky would tell you that once he kicks the football, you've lost a good joke. You can't yes. do it anymore. And interestingly enough, he said at the end, when he had said he couldn't draw the strip anymore, he said, that poor guy, he never got to kick the football. Yeah. So I don't know if Sparky in his heart of hearts thought that he sh could have wrapped up the story, but I don't think, I don't think his mind went that way, you know, that because a cartoonist said to him, well, you know, you could have, you could wrap up the strip Sparky. You could have Sparky um, or Char Charlie Brown kick the football. And um, Sparky said, no, 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 that, that doesn't work. So it's, but it's very interesting. The fact that he himself said the poor guy never got to kick the football. <laughs> Yeah, and millions of people around the world, no doubt, have uh, asked the same question. But it goes back to what you initially said, Gene, about uh, from his mind to his hand to his from his heart to what he put on paper. There was a story there, and uh, God bless him that he uh, continued with that story. I have to say, and uh, uh, humbly I say this, uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to both of you, uh, Gina and Gene. Um, it's one thing that I never uh, thought about until I came on this podcast uh, today. One of the things that I remember about the comics uh, our local newspaper uh, back in London, Ontario, London Free Press, would put the comics out. Any other comic I didn't pay attention to because, and you've probably heard this, and many kids will relate to this uh, going back many years ago, having Silly Putty as a child and with the fresh colored ink on the newspaper, flattening out your Silly Putty and then taking and mirroring it, uh, uh, putting it on the actual comic and then mirroring it back on the Silly Putty. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of that or someone's ever told you that before. Oh, Marty, but I'm old me, enough to remember that. Yes. But for me, <laughs> that that is a memory. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that, Gina. What was that? Oh, I'm in your age group because I remember that. Yeah, what a Maybe pleasure. Maybe that's a new um, cartoonist series is the Silly Putty uh, <laughs> exercise. It's, it's a good way to do it. That's a great idea. It and maybe was. another one is Charlie Brown. What would it have looked like if he actually got to kick the football? Everybody can draw their interpretation of it. It's, sure. a, it's just so funny. I love the. I love that uh, Sparky had a reason for that. And I. And it's such a simple reason, but it's one that just. It's so fun to hear. Jeannie, I have a, just a quick question. I don't know if this has been explained somewhere before, but with the famous catchphrase "Good grief," was that something that Sparky said? all the time before the comic that he brought into it or was that just adapted uh to the character you know, that's a good question whether he hmm. whether he said it he used to say that he didn't swear and he used to say if rats doesn't cover it nothing <laughs> will. um and and i think and he did say good grief but i don't know whether i don't know how much he said it before hmm. he put it in the comic strip that's funny. Maybe maybe you just didn't hear him, Gene. <laughs> when yeah. you said take out the garbage, Sparky, well, he'd I walk in the driveway and go, "Good to grief." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Charlie Brown sure sure brings that out, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And um, you know when his kite is in the tree, and when Snoopy uh, won't eat his dinner because it doesn't have a cherry <laughs> on top, and uh. things like that. And I think for us too, it's so fun when we meet cartoonists because. When they're really good, their car, their car characters have a life of their own. They talk about it, you know, like they try to get out of the way and let the characters talk to each other. So in somehow there's some way these characters are have their own life and their own reality. So they're evergreen to us. I mean, Charlie Brown's still around, right? So if you wrapped it up, maybe it would take some of the magic away because he's it still would. around, you know, for for me. And I always say that Sparky had. He had an affinity for dogs. Um, I was looking at a strip the other day, and I'm not sure that I can remember it, but, oh, I know what it was. It's Snoopy has to go to the vets. And Linus says, oh, I don't know. They'll put him in a cage or something, won't they? And Sparky really felt for the dog that had to be penned up. He had some kind 
some kind of an interior feeling about that. And um, so he just was different. <laughs> but it was wonderful. That strip I know because I love that. And there's yeah. 18,976. So there's a lot of strips, but I know that one. I love that one. And, and I love how Snoopy deals with it. He pretends he's a prisoner of war. You know, he's, he's back. He's the hero. He's the hero. And um, I love how he handles his terrible situation. I have a question for you guys if you want to talk about it, but it does kind of spin off of that. Isn't the uh, isn't someone there or the group involved with Canine Companions, and that's something that has been kind of near and dear to your heart? I have, I have, I have been, and Sparky has been. We've been supporters of Canine Companions since about. 1986 and Sparky was an enthusiastic supporter of them with me. They do some great work and it's something if people want to look into, I'm sure that they can find them online, but uh, that just is like telling to the story of his admiration for the canine folks out there, the pups of the world. I know I would have gotten along with him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to thank you guys for spending time with us today, uh, Gina and Jean. It was so wonderful. And we want to thank everyone for listening in to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts podcast. Uh, if you have a question for one of our experts or an idea for a future episode, please email your questions or requests to info at Zamboni.com. For more information and additional podcast episodes, you can visit Zamboni.com slash podcasts or search Ask the Zamboni Experts on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Paula and Marty wishing you an ice day. <laughs> <laughs>